Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining me here uh, today whenever you may be watching this. Um, good news today. It's a little bit of a shorter time together. Uh, we're going to be celebrating with a number of people who are um, following in obedience in terms of Baptism Sunday, as well as we're going, going to be uh, participating in, in communion uh, this week as well. And so I'm just going to talk actually just for a, a few moments uh, on that topic actually of communion and connection with our series that we've been on for a few weeks, this idea of gratitude, right? Before we do, hopefully, I uh, just want to encourage you to jump on our website, www.myfaithchurch.org. Take advantage of some of the resources that we have available for you and Netflix of Bible Study with our Right Now Media app, instructions on, on how to download uh, that, as well as instructions with our uh, YouVersion uh, Bible app. We hope that you are feeding yourself uh, during the week and not just um, doing something like this, you know, just one time a week. Thank you for your for your contributions, clicking that donate button, uh, texting 73256. We, we appreciate that uh, so much, especially as we go into uh, the end of the year, year here, the holiday season. Um, definitely, we definitely appreciate all that you do. Well, we've been on this series called Gratitude for about three weeks now, and we're going to continue that theme actually uh, here today, even though our time is going to be a bit shortened. I just want to give you a bit of a review uh, of where we have been with this topic of gratitude. The first week, we looked at a guy by the name of Noah, and Noah gives us the basis or the foundation of our gratitude. If you are a believer in Jesus, your gratitude is not based upon a condition. It is based upon Christ, right? We know that the ark is a symbol of Jesus. Those who are in the ark were saved from death and destruction. Those who are in Christ are saved from, from death and destruction. Um, there's so many symbols and connections that we made a few weeks ago in connection with Noah. And one of the connections that we made in terms of gratitude is that Noah's response was of gratitude, and it was grace-based. And the reason why is because he spent a little over a year in that ark, seeing the destruction, seeing the death that was occurring all around him. And yet he was saved by where God had placed him, right? We know that when the ark finally settled and he went outside and walked on land for, for dry, on dry ground, right? You know what? When you have something and then it's lost, you start to appreciate it a little more, then it's given back to you. Well, this new life that Noah had received, he lived a life of gratitude. We see it in his obedience. We see it in his generosity. He sacrificed not out of his plenty, but out of his poverty, right? Um, his, his resources had depleted. Uh, he, he celebrated in, in worship as well. His gratitude was based upon a greater realization of the grace that he had received, his salvation, right? And we understand that is really our motivation for obedience, our motivation for sacrifice. We're called to sacrifice. Um, we're, it's our motivation for our worship. Uh, our motivation is gratitude of the grace that we receive. That is why when it comes to our thankfulness, and when we celebrate Thanksgiving here in this next uh, coming week, Hopefully, we understand, yes, there are material things to be thankful for that God does bless us with, allow us just to have. I mean, he definitely is a provider, correct? But ultimately, our thankfulness, our gratitude is based upon the grace that we have received. It is not based on condition. I hate to tell you this, that if you're not in Christ, right, then your thankfulness and your gratitude is based on the conditions of your life. But if you're a follower of Jesus... No matter what happens, no matter life cannot touch the grace that Christ has given because it is not life's to, to, take, to take away. And so we looked at the foundation of grace or, or gratitude. It's grace that first week when we looked at Noah. The second week we looked at um, why gratitude is essential. And we talked about a generation that was known for grumbling and complaining. They're actually labeled a stiff-necked and, and stubborn generation. And this is the generation that came out of slavery under Moses' leadership. They saw the power of God with the plagues. We know, and we spent some time in this, that 
that the, the plagues, each one of those plagues targeted a God of the Egyptians. God's preaching for nine months as the plagues are occurring, very powerful visual illustrations, right? That he is better and that he is bigger than any of the Egyptian gods. The minds and the hearts of the Egyptians were melting and the thought was that the hearts and the minds of God's people would be emboldened and they were for a period of time but they had a very short memory. They saw the power of the plagues. They saw a rescue at the Red Sea, something that only God could do. They were, they were being pursued, right, by Pharaoh. He changed his mind. There was water before them. There was the army of Egypt behind them, and there were two mountain ranges on the right and the left. They're trapped. Then God did something that only God can do. He made a way when there was no way. They walked across on dry ground. They it's a picture of, of salvation. Only God can do that, right? It's an arrow in many ways to, to Jesus. Only God can do that. And they did worship on the other side for just a moment. And then they went to the desert and they started complaining and they were hungry and they were thirsty. And so God provides uh, drinkable water from water that was bitter, right? Uh, at Mara, that Mara means bitter. It was bitter water, but God's intervention made it sweet. He, he, he uh, allowed bread from heaven, right, to come down from, from the sky and gather on the ground. And yet, because they never really allowed God to change their heart, it impacted their gratitude, their ingratitude of their rescue, their, the power of God that they saw, the provision of God uh, that they literally had in their hands. Ingratitude will affect all of that perception, right? It affected their perception of the past. They thought they were better off as slaves in Egypt. Pretty twisted thinking, isn't it, right? They were free. And yet because of ingratitude, they thought, oh, remember those times when it was just living high on the hog? Well, it wasn't hog because they were Jewish. But, you know, sitting around pots of meat, right? Oh, we had it so good. Really, it affected the memory of the past. It affected their trust in the present. They mishandled the manna, the bread from heaven, they didn't follow God's instructions. And it also impacted their future. That generation did not enter into the promised land. I mean, God was very clear because of their lack of faith, that they were that generation was going to die off. And they wandered around in the wilderness for, for 40 years. Ingratitude is very costly, right? Now, last week, if you were here, we looked at a guy by the name of Elijah. Elijah, uh, uh, an intense guy, a, an extreme guy, because he lived in very extreme times. God provided for him in, in incredible ways. Um, ravens delivered him uh, food. A brook from the Lord uh, allowed him to have water during a time of drought and during a time of famine. And then he takes this, right, this, this trust in the Lord's provision to a widow, and he continues to uh, have flour and oil that never ran out. Now, that was the provision, and we should thank God for his provision. But all that provision was for the mission. And we didn't even get into this last week, this incredible Super Bowl between um, the prophets of Baal and, and, and Elijah, the sole prophet of God on Mount Carmel. The competition was this, whose God can rain down fire and consume the altar? And we know, if you read... First Kings, right? I believe it's chapter 20. God left no doubt who took the field that day. The preparation, the provision was for the mission, right? And throughout Elijah's life, he expresses gratitude, not just for the provision, but for the mission that God had given him. You see, the more that we are on mission, and God gives us our mission, it's the Great Commission, make disciples, right? Teaching people to obey all things, right? And, and so we should be involved in that mission of God in some way, in some form, depending on how God wires us and depending on our circles of influence. God has given every single person who is in Christ a mission. And just like if you wash a car and you're, you're going to get a little wet, if you, if you fix a car, you're going to get a little greasy. If you're, if you're a farmer, you're going to get a little dirt on your clothes, right? If you are a grace distributor, right? And this is really what the Great Commission is. It, is. it is distributing and proclaiming the grace of Jesus. You are going to get a little bit of that grace on you. It's going to, it's, it's going to wear on you, right? It's going to be seen on you. 
you will become more aware of your grace that you have received the more that you are in mission as a grace distributor. More will get on you, and that will allow you to be more of a person of gratitude, right? So that's where we've been for the last three weeks. Now I want to touch on here actually today is this byproduct of gratitude, and that is unifying. It's, it's, it's a unifying thing. See, the early church was so diverse. I mean, even the disciples of Jesus. And if you just kind of can place yourself, perhaps just think back in that very first century, being a Jesus follower, knowing that he had died, knowing that he had rose again. And we know the scripture tells us that he appeared to over 500 people and then he ascended into heaven. And here's this gathering of believers and the disciples who were so diverse. You know, out of the 12 disciples, we could, I could talk forever about the diversity that they had. There was a zealot, um, and a zealot is someone who was so anti-Rome that often the zealots would take a knife and in a crowd go up behind Roman soldiers. A zealot was almost a synonym of assassin. They'd stab him in the back, right? And then there was Matthew, the tax collector, who worked for Rome, right? Then you had dock-hardened, you know, fishermen, right? And so you had all this diversity here. And then the Apostle Paul, he had this, before he was Paul, he was Saul, he saw the resurrected Jesus, his life was chained, changed in a dramatic way. He was a persecutor of, of Christians, and now he's proclaiming, proclaiming the grace, you know, that he once criticized, right? And he's going around in these various cities, and he's testifying of what he of what he experienced and what he saw and who Jesus is and these pockets of gatherings of Jesus followers pop up and they're called churches and they were in all kinds of different cultures people of different backgrounds and yet something drew them together it was their gratitude for what they shared in common even though they were so diverse different backgrounds different temperaments different worldviews um, different r religions that they came out of, right? So many times you see Paul talking about in his letters the thing that binds us all together. He'll say things like, we are all one in Christ, or, or there is neither uh, Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free, for we, are, for we all are all one, right? He, he talks about in 1 Corinthians that we are part of one body, but many parts, right? And then he gets to the issues, but he always reminds us in his writings of what we share in common. There's a good description in Acts chapter 2, and I want to read it here starting in verse 42 of the description of this early church, this gathering of believers. And this word church in the Greek is ekklesia. It just simply means gathering. So we can really substitute the word gathering for church. And this is all it was. Gatherings of people who believe that Jesus had rose from the dead. See, Christianity is so unique. The center of it, the launch of it was not a coming together or surrounding some moral teachings or some ethics or, or, or some type of uh, uh, symbolism. What launched Christianity was an event, and that was the resurrection. And that is what makes Christianity unique. So these gathering of believers believed, and many of them saw with their own eyes, and those who didn't heard firsthand accounts of those who saw the resurrected Jesus. And we have a description of these gatherings here in Acts chapter 2. Let me just read it here today, and you can listen. Follow along if you want to. Acts chapter 2. I'll begin reading here in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. There's four things that they are described as being devoted to, the apostles' teachings. They were in the process of the New Testament being written. And they were gathering around the, the disciples and the apostles, and they were, they were eager to hear the apostles' teachings. Why? Because of a lot of gratitude. Gratitude of what Jesus had done in their life, right? Uh, gratitude of being forgiven from their sins. Gratitude because they knew that Jesus was real. Many of them had seen the resurrected Jesus. 
And so they just wanted to know. They wanted to know as much as they possibly could about the man who had changed them at their core. And they wanted to know how they were to live their lives as an expression of gratitude. They knew they could not repay, but they wanted to know as much as they possibly could. Their motivation was what was central here. Their motivation was correct of wanting to know how to live as an expression of gratitude. We also see that they were devoted to what is called the fellowship, which is basically one another. They were committed to one another. There was no one amongst the fellowship of believers that said, you know what, I'm going to go down to the gathering across the street uh, because there were no other gatherings, right? Sometimes the the less options that we have, right, the better. They, they had to work their stuff out amongst one another because they had no other options. They were committed and devoted to one another, not just to the apostles' teachings, not just to who Jesus was and what he had done for them personally, but they were devoted to one another. They were in relationship and in commitment. We see here that they celebrated what is called the Lord's Supper. We, it's called here the, the breaking of bread. They did this when they would gather together. And we know that the early church gathered together on what we call Sunday, right? And so whenever they gathered, the Lord's Supper, communion, right, is what we call it, was central. And the reason why they did this is because Jesus was very clear right before he went to the cross. He took the bread and he took the cup and he said to his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. It was, a, it was an ordinance of the scripture, right? There's two ordinances that we see in the scripture. One is communion and, and one is baptism. We're going to be doing both of those on Sunday. But in many ways, the center of their meetings was the apostles' teachings. They're devoted to one another. And also, here, the Lord's Supper, breaking bread with one another. This is what Jesus was talking about with his disciples. We also see the fourth thing that they were devoted to was prayer. They didn't have seminars to go to. They didn't have their resources of what was in their deep pockets to, to fall back on. They didn't have strategies or programs, but they did have prayer. They were desperate. They were a subversive culture. They knew this. They knew that many people considered them what we would probably call a cult today. They knew, that eyes were, they knew that eyes were on them. They knew that they were in the minority. And as a result, they were desperate in their prayers, right? And so we read, that's verse 42. And as a result of this, of this devotion to these four things, this is what we see starting in verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. This word awe. It's a word that we use when we don't have words, right? There was a, an energy there, a high spiritual temperature. There was a sense that there is something going on here that is bigger than just us. They had a sense of awe as a result to these four things that they were devoted to, the apostles' teachings, the, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. It produced a sense of awe. We see that in verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold uh, property and possessions and, and, and gave to anyone who had need. You see, this is a description of meeting needs. This doesn't necessarily mean that we have to follow that description. But what they did is they met their needs. This doesn't mean that we have to live in a commune. But whether it was physical needs or emotional needs or mental needs and above all spiritual needs... They knew what they were because they knew one another and they met those needs. They were generous with one another. Generosity is a result, isn't it, of the grace that we have received. It's, a, it's an act of obedient gratitude. We see that every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. This is verse 46. And they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They continued to meet throughout the week. It wasn't just a Sunday experience. You see, this is the second time, and this is the only time in this description. Prayer's not mentioned twice. The apostles' teaching isn't mentioned twice. But what is mentioned twice is breaking of bread. This is the one thing that is repeated twice in this description of the early church because it unified them. 
This is, they, they came to the table. They came to the table because this reminded them of what they shared in common. Jesus was so smart, wasn't he? He understood that there was going to be so much diversity, so many people of different backgrounds, and, by, and also they were just people. They should have killed one another because of how different they were, because of the setting that they were in, because of the, the stress that they were under, but yet they continued to break bread, not just in their official meetings on Sunday, but in homes together spontaneously. They came to the table See, all your differences and your diversity, all of that within the context of what unifies you, coming to the table is what allowed them to survive and also to thrive. And then here in verse 47, here's the result. They praised God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They were gaining a reputation because their character was changing. They were taking care of one another. They were filled with awe and they couldn't contain it. This grace that they focused on of celebrating the, the Lord's Supper in their official meetings and in their homes. And it wasn't just a Sunday experience. They were involved daily in one another's lives. They checked up on one another. The character spilled over to their other relationships and they gained the favor of all people. And also the Lord added to their number daily. Let me read here from Luke chapter 22 in just a moment, starting in verse 14 of Jesus establishing the Lord's Supper. Now we've talked about this word Eucharist, which we translate in the Greek in the New Testament as gratitude. Eucharist, if you're familiar with that word, if that sounds familiar, it's another word really for communion. And the root word, charis, is the word grace. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, when we break bread, as we're going to read here in just a moment, we are celebrating the grace that we have received. This is really what communion is. The grace that Jesus provided us by being our substitute, his body and his blood given to us, so that we can have a removal of our sins and allowed to have a relationship once again with our Heavenly Father that was broken as a result of our sin, the grace that we are given, the Eucharist, the communion, what we all share in common. No one comes to the Lord's table because they're qualified. They come to the Lord's table because they have understood that they're not qualified. We all come to the table on equal footing, and it reminds us, and if there's a key thought, I guess, in all of this is this, is that coming to the Lord's table in the early church allowed them to celebrate what they all had in common, and it gave them a context to address the issues in their lives. And the same thing is true today. We live in a world in which, whether it's politics or social issues or whatever it may be, it is such a divisive, polarizing time, even in the church, we need to take time to come to the table and not sweep our issues under the rug, obviously, but coming to the table, understanding that we are all products of grace, gives us a context to deal with some of this diversity in our lives so that it doesn't become division. So here is Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Jesus was taking the celebration of Passover that we know is a big giant arrow. What happened in Egypt is a big giant arrow, what Jesus is about to do. And he's going to take this and change this in terms of the Lord's Supper, before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after uh, taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And they took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We do this in remembrance of what he has done for us. 
our spiritual ancestors started this as an ordinance because Jesus commanded us to do it. Our spiritual ancestors, hundreds and thousands of years, have been doing this. And we come together at the table on a regular basis to remind ourselves that we are all products of grace and that we share this one thing in common and allows us to have a context to deal with some of the diversive issues in our lives so that it doesn't cause division. Well, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you strength until we meet again. God bless.